I'd like to welcome to the stage former Congressman Beto O'Rourke. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Good to Thanks see you. For having us Please have Thank a seat. You. <laughs> We're here in Texas. That's yeah. right. You Good to, to see everybody. Yeah. You, you know. got some we gotta fans. play homecoming yeah. again for the second time. <laughs> All right, welcome, and thank you for thank joining you. us here at She the People. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be in the home district of Sheila Jackson Lee, back at TSU. Thank you for hosting us, and, and with the two of you, thank you for the invitation uh, you. to join you. We're, we're glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah. We're gonna talk voting rights to kick things off. Um, one of the most important outcomes of 2018 was in Florida, the passage of Amendment Floor, uh, 4. Uh, some of, some of the amazing organizers behind that uh, victory are in the audience today. And it paved the way to restore voting rights uh, to formerly incarcerated people. So what would you do as president to build on these kind of victories to expand the, the, the voting rights for people that have been caught up in the criminal justice system in every state? First of all, let's build on the great work that you have done in Florida. Um, let's, let's pick up the message and the inspiration laid down by Stacey Abrams in Georgia and her response to the State of the Union, where she made this the, the central theme. Um, let's follow the lead of the Texas Organizing Project here in Houston, Texas, and Harris County, which ensured that, that no one is written off and helped to inform those who had been convicted in Texas of their voting rights and that they could register once again and participate in their democracy. And it is owing to them and the leadership that we especially saw here in this community that Texas, which had been 50th in the country in voter turnout, not because we love our democracy any less than anyone else, but because we were drawn that way by our state legislature. We have voter ID laws that say you can use your license to carry a firearm to prove who you are at the ballot box, but you cannot use your student ID from TSU to prove who you are at the ballot box. Uh, we've got to overcome um, the institutional racism in our democracy, especially in the states of the former Confederacy with a new Voting Rights Act that I want to sign into law. Automatic voter registration for every 18-year-old coming of age. Same-day voter registration in this country. Ending gerrymandering, and we are at the epicenter of some of the worst of it here in Texas. And yes, making sure that those who have convictions, who have done time in a country whose criminal justice system is one of the most unjust in the world, where it is disproportionately comprised of people of color. Let us make sure that we restore their full rights, including their right to vote. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you for asking. Congressman, um, we know that the Trump administration is right now attempting to add a citizenship question to the census, to the 2020 census, um, which most experts believe would depress Respondents, responses to the census could actually disenfranchise many um, Americans of color because it would it could reduce the number of representatives uh, and it could also just put fear into communities with lots yeah. of immigrants in them. Texas is one of those states that would be hard hit on all of those fronts. If the Supreme Court affirms and allows this administration to add that question to the census, then what can be done? to ensure that people feel confident and comfortable answering the census, that you don't see a uh, depression in responses that can hurt, particularly immigrant communities here in Texas. Absolutely. So th this is a question about who is counted and who counts in our communities and in our country. I can tell you from the perspective of El Paso, which forms uh, the largest binational community with Ciudad Juarez in the Western Hemisphere, and also happens to be one of the safest cities in the United States, 20 years running. That safety is not despite the fact that we are a city of immigrants and asylum seekers and refugees. It is because we are a city of immigrants and asylum seekers and refugees. And when you listen to our local law enforcement leadership, including Sheriff Richard Wiles, he will tell you that when those in our community, including those in mixed immigration status households, trust um, law enforcement, they're more willing to report a crime, serve as a witness, testify in a trial, demonstrably make us safer because they feel free to participate. When people fear 
their government, law enforcement, participating, it will make us not more, it will make us less safe. And here we are in the most diverse city in the United States of America, bar none. It is hard to think, as you suggested, of, of a community or a state that will be hit harder uh, by, by this misinformed and, and maybe malicious decision than, than Texas. It means that we lose out on funding for schools, for infrastructure, for quality of life and opportunity and an ability to fully participate in this economy. And it sows fear um, in, in our communities at a time that we need to bring everyone together and out of the shadows to, to build our, our country's greatness. As president, I would nominate a Secretary of Commerce who would make sure that everyone is counted, everyone is included. Um, if this uh, decision is upheld by the Supreme Court, it is one that we will challenge uh, from, from our administration, make sure that is overturned and that everyone in this country is counted. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I believe you have questions? Yeah. Let's bring on our first questioner. Hello, um, my name is Damaris. I'm a 17-year-old undocumented student. Um, I'm here with United Leader in Action. I know that you're from a border city and you have seen the horrible detention camps there and in other states. Um, what is your plan to pass new citizenship laws and protect immigrants from deportation? Um, my life and many of these beautiful people's lives are on the line. So. How are you going to make sure that these um, immigrants, our immigrants, are protected and not harmed? Thank you. Damaris, thank you. Thanks for being here and for the question and, and for your leadership. And it is a reminder to me, to all of us, that the great changes that we have seen in this country's history has so often been produced and purchased by the service and the sacrifice of young people like you. We were just in Greensboro, North Carolina, and we think about the Greensboro Four who, who helped to integrate places of public accommodation, uh, the Rock Hill Nine in, uh, the Friendship Nine in Rock Hill, South Carolina, the Freedom Riders uh, in, in the Deep South, the Dreamers today who are standing up not just for themselves, for their parents, the original dreamers, and for immigrants across this country from every, uh, every place uh, on this planet to make sure that they are permanently freed from any fear of deportation by making them U.S. citizens in this country. That would be the first order of business. <laughs> Ensuring that their parents and, and millions more can come out of the shadows as well, contribute to their full potential, to their families, to their communities, and to this country's greatness and to our shared success. And you mentioned these detention camps that we saw in Tornillo, Texas. What I saw from you, from the people of Texas, is that with under 24 hours notice, more than a thousand of you showed up in the Chihuahuan Desert outside of Tornillo to bear witness, to testify, to make sure that our fellow Americans understood what was being done in our names, that we were taking children from their mothers and fathers after having completed a more than 2,000 mile journey, fleeing the deadliest places on the planet today, trying to follow our own asylum laws, and I would argue being illegally blocked and rejected and arrested and separated and caged by this president and this administration. Um, leadership like yours forced the administration, at least temporarily, to stop separating families. Now the onus is on us not only to pass comprehensive immigration reform that we just described, but to ensure that not another child is taken from another parent and that we reunite those families who've been separated so far. So thank you, Merit, for being here. May I ask you a quick follow-up? The, the, there are still some children that have not been returned to their parents. Should there be some sort of civic sanction for those who advocated a policy of separating mothers and fathers from their children and not returning them? I think with, without accountability, you, you won't have justice. Without justice, you will not have rule of law in this country. And without accepting that no person, no matter what office he occupies, is, is above the law, then this country's not going to fulfill its promise or live according to its, its constitution. So yes, there have to be consequences for people who rejected asylum seekers who were lawfully trying to present themselves at our international ports of entry with not a penny to their name, um, fearing for their lives and the lives of their kids, attempted again to follow our laws by crossing in between ports of entry, 
arrested themselves, and this is the parlance of the Border Patrol agents, they tell us they don't flee detection and apprehension, they turn themselves in seeking refuge and shelter from a country of refugees and asylum seekers, and to be met not with salvation but your worst nightmare, that child torn from your arms by force, put into a cage, you deported back to the very country from which you fled, yes, there has to be consequence for those kind of actions. And I want to make sure we hold everyone responsible, accountable. You mean legal sanction, a civic sanction, lawsuits, what do you mean? A absolutely. Uh, where people broke the law. And, and my understanding, especially when it comes to our asylum laws, it is very clear if you come here, petition for asylum, which affords you no guarantee that that petition will be accepted, that you will be able to stay here, but that you at least be allowed to follow that process here on U.S. soil. That's the law, uh, at least as I understand it. I want to make sure that it is followed, and those who defy it are held accountable. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think someone was asking, should ICE be disbanded? Yes! Come on. <laughs> I hear you on this. The, the, the practices um, under this president, the practices under the last president, where families were broken up, where you had internal enforcement. I think in one year alone, in the previous administration, 400,000 deportations from inside the United States, some people who had been here for decades, who posed no threat to their families, to their communities, to this country. In fact, in any way that you can measure, are contributing far more than they are ever taking. And I made the case earlier, using El Paso as the example, are also contributing to our security and to our safety. We don't need those internal roundups and deportations and enforcement. We do need to make sure that anyone who threatens the lives of our fellow Americans or who has used violence, that there is accountability, okay? But I wanna make sure that we include everyone in the solution to our challenges, economic, security, safety, democratic, or otherwise, and having these ICE internal enforcement operations is not the way to do it. So, so appreciate under the question. So under administration, will ICE exist, yes or no? Yes, um, it will, but it will, not, it, will not, it will not employ those practices that we've seen, not just under this administration, but under the previous okay. administration. Okay. Thank Thanks you. for asking. Thank you. Let's have our second um, question from the audience. Thank you, welcome to the stage. Hi, Congressman O'Rourke. My name is Takiva Russell. I'm a restaurant, I'm a member leader of Restaurant Opportunity Centers, and I'm a server in New Orleans where the minimum wage is just $2.13 an hour. Most of the 5 million tip workers and 13 million restaurant workers across the country who earn at sub ridiculous sub-minimum wage are women and people of color like me who suffer from, who have to deal with and suffer from sexual harassment just to get the tips and wages that we deserve. For example, I was working a night shift at my job and I was turned down tip from a male customer who refused to give me a tip because I refused to give him my number. So there are currently two bills that have been introduced in Congress to get rid of the lower wage for tipped workers so that we get a full livable minimum wage like everyone else. So Congressman O'Rourke, my questions to you are, what are your plans to ensure that all workers, including tilt workers like me, get the full wages that we deserve so that we can feed our families without being harassed daily? Thank you. Thank you for the question, for offering your experience as an example for the urgency with which we must meet this challenge. So yes, uh, I support a $15 minimum hourly wage uh, in this country for everyone without exception, uh, regardless of uh, your occupation. Um, I want to make sure that you are protected from uh, harassment and intimidation in, in your place of work. So I want to strengthen those protections and the accountability and justice for those who, who violate the, the protections that are in place. But I also want to acknowledge that a minimum wage is not going to be enough, especially when it comes to women of color. Women alone in this country are paid 80 cents on average what a man is paid for the same job, but African American women, 61 cents of what a man is paid. Latinas, 53 cents of what a man is paid. We also need an equal rights amendment ratified in this country so that no woman can be discriminated against on any basis whatsoever. So th those yeah. are the ways that I want to meet this challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and a follow-up for the ERA, since you, that, that's a big one. As a 
President, how would you champion an ERA for the 21st century? You know, I would make sure that we have conversations just like the one that we had. It's, it's not enough uh, to be on the right side of this issue, um, to, to lay out a vision for, for where we need to get to. I think bringing everybody in, as we learn traveling to the 254 counties of the state of Texas, no matter how red or blue, how big or small, nobody written off, everyone included in, in the conversation, and, and what we found time and again were so many inspiring examples of local leadership. I think of one in particular, a, a councilwoman in DeSoto, Texas, Candace Quarles, who just helped to pass paid family leave to correct some of the economic injustice and lack of access and, and opportunity. So let's make sure that Candace is, is helping to lead that conversation in DeSoto and, and Dallas County, and then do that across yeah. the country, yeah. especially in those states that will be critical in ratifying the ERA so that it becomes part of our constitution. Mm. Yeah. All right, Thank well, you. our exit question that we've been asking um, with so many people running, 20, we've been saying, and counting, we don't know, there could be 40 by next week. <laughs> um, and with so much diversity uh, among those who are running, women, people of color, why should women of color choose you? So, <laughs> it's... <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait. Yeah. We'll wait. <laughs> Take your time. I will. Um, you know, not something that, that I'm owed, um, not something that I expect, uh, something that I fully hope to earn by the work that I do on the campaign trail, by, by showing up and listening to the people that I want to serve. Uh, I was just talking to Sheila Jackson Lee uh, backstage, extraordinary leader and mentor to me when I was a member of Congress. Uh, we talked about reparations and her House Bill 40 that is so important to the future of everyone in this country to ensure that we know our history, our true story, so that we stop visiting injustices on future generations and begin the work of repair. I remember meeting with council member Amanda Edwards, again here in Houston, Texas, on access to capital for communities that have been excluded from capital from the very foundation of this country. Um, talking to Alyssa Simmons, who heads up the NAACP in Arlington, Texas, this state is at the epicenter of a maternal mortality crisis, three times as deadly for women of color. She explained to me that in a community like Arlington that does not have a mass transit system, even if you're covered, try getting to a clinic or a hospital. And then someone else interjected, even if you get to that clinic or hospital, there is disparate treatment for women of color in this country that also helps to explain a disparity in infant mortality that is greater now between white America and black America in 2019 than it was in 1850, 15 years before the abolition of slavery. So showing up, listening, incorporating what I hear everyone's experiences into this campaign, into our service, is how I hope to earn the support and the vote of the people of this country. So, and there you have it, Congressman Ben Thank you. Appreciate it. Very much. Thank you so much for joining us. Is she the very people? Good. Excellent. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're going this way. Wait. Oh. <laughs> the other way.